Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. And welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today I am welcoming back one of my favorite historians and lecturers. And Barry is always welcome to come on my show. And he is part of the Distinguished Lecturer Organization of American Historians. And that's a mouthful. <laughs> Gee, I would love to be one of those people. And I'm so honored to have you back. Barry, and we are going to be kind of deciphering what happened. We're trying to explain what happened and the election results. And one thing I know, Barry and I do have some differences <laughs> of our who we like and who we don't like, and we get along famously. In fact, we just even had a little lunch at the Bluegrass today, and we were going over everything, and we did see a lot of differences of opinions, but guess what? We're still friends, <laughs> and and he was he's going to always be invited back, even if our politics are a little bit different. So, well, welcome, Barry, thank again. Thank you, and the fact of the matter is that you don't have the slightest idea what my politics are, because as a historian, my job is to look at facts and make logical interpretations based on those facts. Historians don't start with a conclusion and end with a theory. They begin with facts and end with a conclusion. And so um, the one thing that we will absolutely agree on is that bluegrass has wonderful food. <laughs> and they agreed on that. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I, you know, we'll start with something that I read. So I want to, I just want to read this to our viewers because what we're going to be talking about is the electoral uh, system, the way we vote. And it's so confusing. No one seems to understand it. And um, I just want a little something that are from our founding fathers. So the election was rigged in the sense that the founding fathers created a system that, at this point in history, tilts the playing field in favor of candidates who appeal to low population states and a small set of contested swing states rather than those who appeal appeal to big urban centers in population-rich states that are not contested. Now, what does that mean? Please, please inform our viewers because this is so confusing. <laughs> in fact, you know, as we're, we're part of Illinois, and as I understand it, our vote doesn't even count. In fact, neither of the candidates really came to Illinois. Maybe they came to have lunch, but <laughs> basically they didn't really uh, try to woo our voters because they knew that Illinois basically votes uh, Democratic. And so they didn't even have to, and they probably didn't come because our vote doesn't even count. And that's kind of a, that's kind of sorry, but our founding fathers must have had something in mind. So what, what, what happened, Barry? Well, it's, it's intriguing. First of all, our votes absolutely count because Illinois votes in the Electoral College and those votes count the same as the votes from any other state. The difference is that the Founding Fathers set up a system in which you could run an election strategically rather than nationally. Um, think about it this way, Suzanne. Normally, a candidate for office has two goals to win the election and to get the most votes. And normally those two goals are exactly the same. When we talk about Donald Trump's victory in the presidential election, we have to remember that he is 
going to end up probably being about two million votes behind Hillary Clinton. So if we talk about the Democratic failure, we have to remember they got more votes, that we're working within a system that doesn't allow for all votes to be counted equally. It disproportionately allows swing states and smaller population states to affect the electoral college. But Donald Trump lost this election by somewhere between one and a half and two million votes nationally. But strategically, he played a great game of getting the votes where he needed them. How did he know how to do that and Hillary Clinton did, didn't do it? I mean, how did his team, I mean, I'm not sure he did it. You know, he hired a team, she hired a team that was supposed to do this for them. How did she, and she's, I mean, first of all, Donald Trump, uh, you, you know, he's more of a television star, The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the, uh, he's not a political, you know, person as such. And she has run, she's run in the other election with, uh, when she was uh, with, against uh, our President Obama. And she's, she's been in politics for 30 years or so. How did she not do this? Well, you know, first of all, I think we should start giving credit where it's due. Donald Trump entered the Republican primaries against a lot of people of serious and significant accomplishment, and he beat them all one by one. You had governors like Governor Walker of Wisconsin, Governor Perry of Texas, uh, Governor Bush of Florida, Governor Christie of New Jersey, Governor Kasich of Ohio, all of whom had significant accomplishments that they could point toward. He beat them all. He beat every senator. He beat the vanity candidates. He beat the celebrity candidates. He beat all of them. And Ms. Farino, too, wasn't yep. she there? She mm -hmm. was then there. Right. And then he did beat, in the sense of strategically winning the election, somebody who not only has run for national office as a presidential candidate, but also who had twice won election in the United States Senate in one of the largest states in the country. I give him credit. His strategy was excellent. What he couldn't do was to convince more people to vote for him than voted for Hillary Clinton. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Why did Hillary Clinton not do that? Some of that was just bad planning and strategy on the part of the people who were advising her. Um, she spent more money trying to win the single electoral vote in the county surrounding Omaha, Nebraska, than she did on Wisconsin, which was strategically a stupid thing to do. You know, I heard, <laughs> I heard that her husband, and I don't know how true this is, you know, these rumors, alleged things, and they, they said that Bill was trying to get her to do that and talk to her campaign people, and he was kind of, you know, like, come on, you know, kind of laughed mm -hmm. off, you know, like he didn't know what he was talking about. And apparently he did, and no one listened to him. Yeah, it's interesting. Bill Clinton, when he ran for president, famously in his war room had a gigantic poster that filled the wall that said, it's the economy, stupid. Mm -hmm. Because that was what people were voting on. And Bill Clinton, according to the reports we've seen, was trying to make the argument that Hillary Clinton needed to pass along an economic message to convince people why it was in their economic best interest to vote for her. And instead, I think the perception is that she was running a campaign more along the lines of arguing on social issues, on uh, the misogyny that Donald Trump had expressed toward women, on threats toward gay rights and minorities and things like that, all of which are obviously very important and motivated more people to vote for her than voted for Donald Trump, but that she couldn't carry an economic message that convinced people in Michigan and in Pennsylvania, where she really needed those mm -hmm. votes to come out and support her. Because years ago, we had, a, you know, I know my dad worked at a company uh, until he retired at 65. I believe that's when retirement was, you know, they had to retire at 65. And, you know, he had. He knew that he was going to be. He was going to get a pension. They weren't going to mm -hmm. fire him unless he did something horrible. And he and, and see now people. You know, we in the rural areas. They were talking about. You know, we, in fact, we were talking about earlier. You know, people have to know to put 
you know, they, they live from paycheck to paycheck. I know people that have, uh, I know some, some of my friends' kids live from uh, credit card to credit card. They have <laughs> 10 credit cards, and they're paying on each one of their credit cards. But people that have families in rural areas, you know, they're trying to figure out cornflakes or frosted flakes, you know, it, it, the boxes have doubled and tripled. They're just trying to feed their families. I mean, it's fine to know, oh, maybe uh, he's a sexist, he's a racist, he's this or he's that. But when it comes to putting food on the table, survival takes over every time. I would agree. And I think that one of, one of Hillary Clinton's greatest failures was to connect the economic recovery that we've experienced in the last eight years with the fact that it came under a Democratic president. If you look at what unemployment was when Barack Obama took office, if you look at the rate of domestic growth, if you look at the number of startups, of business startups under Barack Obama, the economy has recovered. It hasn't recovered as quickly or as massively as we would like. But we are so much better off today as a nation after eight years of Barack Obama's presidency than we were after eight years of George W. Bush's presidency that that should, be, should have been an easy argument for Hillary Clinton to make. Here's the number of unemployed under the last Republican president. Here's the number of unemployed today. Um, and what Hillary Clinton didn't do was to make that economic case well enough. She actually had the numbers on her side. Now, every president is going to have a mixed legacy. George Washington did, Lincoln did, FDR did. That's taken for granted. And you can nitpick and find statistics that will support you. But if you look at how many people were unemployed under George W. Bush, and how many people were unemployed under Barack Obama, the situation has gotten much better. If you look at how many businesses have started up, if you've looked at the fact that we have had an unbelievable streak of private business job growth in this country under Barack Obama, that's the argument Hillary Clinton should have been making. Because I think your essential argument is right, that that's what people are concerned about, that while most Americans don't want gay people to be discriminated against and don't want minority people to be discriminated against. They needed an affirmative reason to vote for Hillary Clinton. And a lot more did than voted for Donald Trump, but not the right people in the right states. Right, and people, um, it is, it's, it's, when you talk about more jobs, but there are so many people um, that have stopped looking for jobs because they can't find it, because they can't, they're, we're talking about the poor people in this country seem to be taken care of. They get, they get stamps, you know, food stamps. They get Medicaid. I know people that are that really are struggling, and they get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of positive stuff that comes out of the government. Mm -hmm. And but the people in the middle class, their salaries are just a little bit too high, and they don't qualify for food stamps. They don't qualify yeah. for subsidies. And this is the, this is middle America. That's who's hurting. Mm -hmm. People that live in the rural sector of our country and they're the ones that they haven't had any increase in their jobs I think I spoke about my even my one of our daughters who worked for the school system here in Chicago and she worked for it for four years without a penny raise and after school program she had to go out of her own pocket never got reimbursed took these kids out on a school all kinds of school things after school functions and she did it on her own at, at her own small little salary never getting a reimbursement so these are the people that are really hurting you know the the elite people and I think this is what happened with Hillary Clinton I think she was talking more to the elite to the elite you know and talking about what you know what Trump did and what all his faults rather than talking to the people that really needed help the middle class the middle class not the again I'm stressing not the poor people but the middle class those are the people that are suffering and also people like coal mines you know, are closing. People's, uh, people are losing their jobs. She didn't talk to the coal miners. She was talking about closing the coal mines and starting other things. And, and people need those type of jobs. You know, there, there, are several, there are several issues that come to mind in what you've said. The first is, you say she didn't talk to the middle class. She spoke to the elites. She got 
over one and a half million more votes than Donald Trump did. So her message was being heard. More people agreed with her message than with Donald Trump's message. What Donald Trump did well was to play into a generalized sense of fear and anxiety about a changing country. Uh, the fact of the matter is that most of the manufacturing jobs which have left America are never, ever coming back. We are not going to be a country of huge manufacturing in the way that we were in our parents' generation. Are they, the are they of this going country, away, Barry, because that we were taxing them too much? There were so many tariffs on them. They were getting cheaper wages, you know, people that could work for them, you know, in other countries. Like Kids uh, on the North Shore are desperate to get Air Jordans. Do you know how much the, the child workers of Singapore who make Air Jordans get per hour? They don't get a living wage. They don't get anything close to a living wage. Probably what I got when I was a teenager, 75 cents an hour. They don't make that much in some places, whereas the only American-made uh, sneaker, as we would have called them, is New Balance. It's the only company left that can do it, and they have a hard time being price competitive because American industry has to pay workers a living wage. If we want to bring those manufacturing jobs back, all we would have to do is to say, if we agree to pay workers 2 to $3 an hour, we can bring every one of those jobs back. Is that the country we want? Co coal miners, um, is, is, it's an interesting case in point, is the future of America in coal energy. America's got a lot of coal. America has more wind than Saudi Arabia has oil. Which one is ultimately better for the environment? Which is ultimately better for the economy, and which is ultimately better for the workers and the people who have to live in this country? And the answer is renewable energy. So the case that Hillary Clinton could have made would have been look at the percentage of foreign oil that America has imported. It has dropped enormously under the last eight years of a Democratic administration. So what happens if we're not buying oil from the Middle East? Every dollar that doesn't go to the Middle East is a dollar that doesn't go to terrorists who have mm -hmm. access to that money. She didn't make that argument. And here's where I think Donald Trump did what Bill Clinton did when he ran uh, in 1992 and what Ronald Reagan did when he ran for president. And that is they offered a clear, concise mm -hmm. narrative. They talked this to the is, people. This is why I am running. But Ronald mm -hmm. Reagan said, right. Government is the enemy. Ronald Reagan looked in the cameras and said, the scariest words you can hear are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. He then oversaw, yeah, and, a, wait, he then oversaw right. a period of government expansion. Ronald Reagan said to people, the national debt is hurting you. I will cut the national debt in half and balance the budget in four years or I won't run for re-election. Wait, right. he expanded the national mm -hmm. debt more than every other president before him put together. So why did Ronald Reagan win re-election overwhelmingly? The reason is because what he did, what Bill Clinton did, and what Donald Trump did, was he appealed to generalized fears of Americans without offering a reasonable, workable solution to those problems. See, and, it's, and I, I agree with you. And I also think she was giving a lot of free, you know, uh, incentives, freebies that, you know, out. And I think, you know, I think with men, you know, women are, women don't mind, I mean, Women like to work as well, but if a woman isn't working, she could find things that she can do. She could do things with her friends. She could do things, um, you know, there's a lot of things that she could donate her time to charity, to fundraisers and things like that. But men like to work. Men feel that working and being a man, it, it ties them together. And um, and I, I know I sound maybe sexist right now because, you know, um, you know, I... I, in fact, um, this is, you know, people at our studio, by the way, uh, we, we very, there's only a couple people, uh, I think one person, that take, even has a salary. All of us, we don't have a salary. We donate our time. We donate our time to uh, the station. Mm -hmm. We have our camera people, our producers, directors, uh, all the people that work in the studio do not take salaries. 
And um, so we know how to occupy our time, but men, most men, in fact, you know, middle-aged men, uh, they still want to work. And they don't want to take the freebies. It's nice that it's offered, you know, incentives like she was offering, the government will do this for you, but they want a job. They, it, makes, it makes them feel good. People, when they work, it makes them feel good. And I think that's what he spoke to. Well, We're going to get your jobs back. We're going to create yeah. new jobs. And I think that's what the problem was. Well, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't address the psychology of women as relates to work. That's no, far outside of my I, area of expertise yeah. as a historian. But women but, like to work, but you know, uh, they know they know how to they know how to if they're not working, how to occupy their time. But people do like to work. The sense of bringing home a paycheck and taking care of your family is important. Right. And, and they feel you know, good about themselves doing I it. I agree. And the fact that unemployment has dropped so tremendously under Barack Obama's eight years of his presidency should have been one of Hillary Clinton's top talking points. I could anticipate her running commercials saying, here is a graph of how many people were unemployed the last time a Republican president was in. Here's how many are unemployed today. Now, have all of those middle class, upper income jobs come back? No, they haven't. The economy is constantly in flux. This is a historical truth. But consider this fact. This is, again, if Hillary Clinton for some reason had asked my opinion, what I would have said to her is, beginning in 1928, which will take us back to the beginning of voting for almost everybody watching this show. There's probably very few people watching today who were voting before 1928. So if we use that as our starting point, under every single Republican president from 1928 until 2008, under every single Republican president except Ronald Reagan, unemployment has gone up. Under every single Democratic president from 1928 to present times, with the exception of Jimmy Carter, unemployment has gone down. So but maybe it's why don't we make that argument? Yeah, but maybe it's the why type of employment that they want, too. Wait, but, but wait a minute. This is... A fact. This isn't an interpretation. Mm -hmm. okay. The numbers support. That's right, that I forget your historian. The numbers support that, with the exception of Ronald Reagan, every Republican president has led to less employment, and every Democratic president, with the exception of Jimmy Carter, where the unemployment rate stayed more or less stable, has increased employment. Now, the kinds of jobs, what industries they're going to be in, there's a, a marvelous movie starring Gregory Peck and Danny DeVito called Other People's Money. Oh, yes. That in which good. Gregory Peck plays the head of a wire and cable company that is firmly rooted in a small town in New England. And he makes the argument that we should keep this business open because of the history of it. And Danny DeVito makes the countervailing argument. He said, you know, at one time, there were probably 100 companies in this country making buggy whips. Mm -hmm. And I bet the last one in existence made the best buggy whip in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you want to own stock in that company? Honestly, although coal will be a part of the American economy for a long time, I would rather own stock in wind power and solar power and geothermal power because that's where we're going. And just interestingly today, uh, President-elect Trump announced that he is now open to the Paris Climate Change Accord. Now, whether by the time this views, he'll still be in that <laughs> point of view, I couldn't tell you. But, but what he's recognizing is that America cannot stand alone among industrialized nations. And coal is ultimately not good for our environment, and it's ultimately not all that good for our economy. I think there's a new thing. Um, I was listening to a radio show that was talking about bio-coal. It's another product, I guess, from coal, from trees, that can be also used. So there's other things that can be a new type of business that can use coal, but maybe in not in the same way that it was used in all the years that they've been doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, consider this. For years, the government has given subsidies to farmers, particularly in Iowa, to turn over part of their corn crop to create ethanol. This ethanol subsidy is the example of a government program that nobody needs or wants except for voters in a swing state. Corn could be used to feed hungry people, not just in America, but around the world. And instead, we're using it for an additive that doesn't help cars and doesn't particularly help the environment. Instead, why couldn't we consider, why, because the president-elect 
is a creative thinker. He's a big thinker. Donald Trump doesn't think small thoughts. He thinks big thoughts. Right. I, I've done biographies of him at some of the senior centers and some of the libraries in this area. He thinks big thoughts. Why couldn't we take the ethanol subsidy and say, you know what, we're not going to give it to you anymore. We'll give you the same amount to put a wind generator on your mm -hmm. farm to allow you not to have to import costly forms of energy. So maybe this is part of the why he did win, because he's more innovative thinker on things. And she and she did not, she was still old hat. She was still thinking about the way um, you know, politics used to be run. And I think that's, she didn't come across to the voters, especially the voters that really, you know, people that, you know, have money, people that are, don't have to worry about putting that extra, Buy, buy that extra uh, cereal, and because it's a little bit more expensive, you know, we don't have to worry about that. Certain areas of, you know, Illinois, we're, we're very fortunate here, but not everybody is. And I think that's what happened. He talked to the other voters. Well, and he I, I lost would agree a, with that, but I'm yeah. going to come back to the same point that I've made five times, and I'll probably make five more times. She got more votes. That's true. Now, again, I'm not disputing. The legality but he got of, them important votes, wait, right? I'm, I'm not disputing, as a historian, I'm not disputing the legality of Donald Trump's election and the fact that the Electoral College has worked the way it is constitutionally set up to work. That's not the argument. But if the argument is who talked to voters better, I would ask who got more votes. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact of the matter is that the Electoral College system itself is an archaic institution that ceased serving any valuable function with the passage of the 12th Amendment in the early 1800s. But we can't change it right now, but people are working on it. Well, like it, could be changed by, it could be changed by a constitutional amendment, but the Republican Party has no incentive to do that. If we begin with the election of 1992 with Bill Clinton winning, and we bring it forward to the uh, to the election of 2016 with Donald Trump winning through the Electoral College. Actually, Donald Trump didn't like the Electoral College right. until he's, he won. He spoke against he it. He spoke against it. But again, taking it historically in that time frame, 1992 to the present, the Democrats have won the popular vote in six